I've played a crap load of games in 2023 and usually I do a top 10 games of the year video to compress it all down in a simple digestible list while quickly speed running through some of my thoughts. But this time I want to take a different approach so I decided to rank every game of 2023 that I've played which is a total of 35 plus games and uh, yeah I'm going to quickly speed through all of them and give you my focal week opinion on them of course big fat disclaimer this is my personal list and it is not factual so don't get your torches and pitchforks out okay it is just my le opinion there is really no need for a big convoluted intro so uh, let's just jump straight into it starting with the worst game which is of course <laughs> Skull Island Rise of Kong is glued and duct taped together with sticky disgusting napkins and spoiled jam. It is a beat em up action adventure game where you play as the beloved character King Kong while going through a string of bare bones empty levels while fighting some dinos and other creatures here and there. This is the combat, by the way. Yeah, it, it's not good. I mean, you take one glance at this title and you can just instantly see that it is a piece of junk. I've played a lot of bad games this year and we're gonna go over quite a few in this video. But this is without a single doubt the worst one. It isn't even a competition. So a uh, big shout out to Nintendo for making such a cool Donkey Kong game. 10 out of 10. Avatar The Last Airbender Quest for Balance is a retelling of the Avatar The Last Airbender TV series in video game form and it is a really sloppy retelling because it skips major plot points and story details from the show so it can jam it all into an 8 hour or so game that is mediocre at best. The gameplay can be best described as a dreadful Lego game without any Lego game charm. There are boring mediocre puzzles, bad combat and a a lot of fetch questy missions repeat that 80 times and you have this game it is just insulting to the ip that it is based on just go watch the original show instead if you're interested because that one is actually good In Funny Gollum Game, you play as a filthy creature while doing slave labor. Uh, that's the entire thing. There's nothing more to it. This is the only title on this list that actually just makes me sad by just looking at it. It is such a depressing, unfun adventure. And it's honestly a miracle that they even decided to push it out. The only reason why I'm putting it above these is because there is at least some sort of game here. I can at least see that they tried, which is something I can't say about the other two. But yeah... Um, it's awful and I really don't want to talk about it more so uh, next game Redfall is a co-op open world first person shooter about a city that is overrun by vampires. It's also a game that was released in a completely broken state because the title was heavily underdeveloped and a thick layer of polish was clearly missing from it. Personally, I'm a big fan of the parts where you can shoot a soft comfy pillow and see concrete bullet decals appear. Just such a cool artistic choice. Everything about this title is kind of mediocre or straight up bad but it does have one redeeming quality though because it is kind of funny to play it with friends to see how bad it is so you can laugh the pain away and point out all the funny glitches and major flaws uh, besides that uh, yeah there's nothing here also uh, phil spencer just straight up said that this game sucks balls so you should probably just take his word on it <laughs> Forspoken is an open world magic parkour Hello. game where you play as a massive asshole that is accommodated by an equally mean cuff and these two bicker and fight for the entire journey and it's super annoying, can they shut up? But besides that, uh, the gameplay itself is also just kind of whatever. It's not atrocious or bad, but most of the things in this game are go to waypoint, clear objective, go to next waypoint, clear objective. It's just really monotonous and it just feels like a checklist. And also, as a fun bonus, they are charging 80 goddamn euros for this. Are you insane? What is wrong with you? This game is really stupid. Uh, please don't buy it. 
The only reason why I'm putting Garden of Ban Ban above these five is because it's funny to play ironically. Besides that, yeah, there's nothing worthwhile here. And yes, before someone asks it, I'd rather play this over for Spoken. Please don't add me. You know those funny fake mobile game ads that get shoved in your face every time you try to watch a YouTube video on your phone? Well, the creator of Katamari Damacy made a game about that called Those Games, which is a funny idea on paper and the mini games do make my little pea-sized autistic brain very happy, but the presentation and gameplay of it all is just too shabby and unpolished that it makes it hard for me to actually recommend. It just feels too slapped together without much thoughts. But still, uh, uh, you know, I, I have YouTube. YouTube shorts brain rot and uh, this makes me very happy. There was once a little bozo that really hated pineapple on pizza, so uh, they decided to make a little game about it. Um, yeah, that's all I'm gonna say. Uh, you can play it for free on Steam, it's only 10 minutes long, so uh, go check it out after this video. I'm not saying anything more. Including this game is kind of cheating, but what are you gonna do? It's my list, so go eat a shoe. Counter-Strike 2 is just CSGO jammed into the Source 2 engine, which was a necessary upgrade, even though this is one of the laziest games Valve has ever created because of the lack of content. Now, I've played Counter-Strike 2 for a total of 20 minutes this year, which is basically just two games, but the reason why I'm adding it to this list is because they added one achievement for just booting up the game, so uh, this is the easiest game I've ever 100%ed. It literally took me one second, which is pretty funny, honestly. Alright, so uh, I've been very vocal with my thoughts on FNAF Security Breach for the past two years or so, so it should come to a big surprise that I actually somewhat like Ruin, because all the jank of the base game has just been sucked out of it. They actually morphed it into a very linear experience, which I prefer over the mindlessly wandering around a massive empty facility with nothing to do besides get caught by stupid robots that walk around in circles. It's actually pretty interesting to see what happened to the pizza plex after the events of security breach seeing it all broken and decayed i don't think it's amazing or anything it's still very flawed but it is a big step up in my opinion which uh, seems to be the unpopular opinion <laughs> High on Knife is a DLC for High on Life, which was the talking gun game that everyone hated for some reason. I really liked High on Life though, and while High on Knife does have some snarky, funny jokes, fun new mechanics and more knifey content, which is great, shout out to Michael Kusak, but the whole thing just doesn't hit as hard compared to the main game. It's also really short, like a two hour short, which is fairly disappointing. It's decent, uh, if you liked High on Life, you will probably enjoy this. Venba is a very short story cooking game about an Indian family that immigrates to Canada. And well, I say cooking game, but you cook about seven meals in this title. The rest of it is basically just a visual novel. It has a very heartwarming story to tell, uh, don't get me wrong, and the art is very pleasant to look at. It makes me want to cook a bunch of Indian food, but there is no real gamey game here. It's just, again, a short story and nothing more. Still, it's very touching and I liked it quite a lot. In Pizza Possum, you play as a possum that runs around like an idiot while eating everything on sight. Yeah, and th that's the entire game. It's a funny and chaotic little title that will give you a couple of laughs here and there. Nothing super special, but still enjoyable. Sudorigalia, however you pronounce this, is a metroidvania with a big emphasis on platforming, which they really did fine tune to the absolute max, because your character is immensely satisfying to control. Dashing and bouncing across areas, doing funky tricks, mastering the movement, it is all genuinely a blast. I only have two big gripes with it. Uh, one, you get lost way too quickly because you have no map and every room looks exactly the same. And two, why am I playing as a a humanoid goat with a big ass, well we, we all know why, but it has literally no importance to the overall narrative or world. Like, I just want to play a game man, like come on. I really liked it though, so, you know, it gets a thumbs up, it's a good game. 
Killbox is a high score based boomer shooter where you kill a crap load of insects and see them explode into dozens of little chunks. It's kind of like the cyber grind from Ultra Kill as a standalone game with different mechanics. This game was actually available to play at PAX Australia this year where you could win a pin if you got a score of 50k or more and take a guess who won that pin baby. Yeah that's right it's me I'm the realest video game gamer. It's a very fun little game but there just isn't a lot to it. One or two hours in and you've experienced everything. I still recommend it though, it's a lot of fun. Gunbrella is about an old man that has a uh, gun umbrella that he can shoot, glide or reflect enemy projectiles with. And honestly, it's one of the most slept on titles of 2023, which, uh, you know, I, I can kind of understand. This year has been insane. Fun, interesting characters, gorgeous pixel art, fun gunplay and movement. It's a nice little package. It won't blow you away, but it has some neat things hidden in it. Let me tell you about the friends that invested all they had on a shady site that looked like a scam. The best way I can describe friends versus friends is with the word overwhelming even after playing it for almost 30 hours i feel like i'm stuffing my face into a learning colors with spider-man gta video this is a first person pvp card based shooter where you get a set of random cards each round all with their own effects when you use them like getting more health or decreasing the enemy's movement speed there are some cool strategies you can pull off with a friend and getting to unlock a new card is always fun but everything is just way too hectic in practice that it becomes confusing to play but still um i played it quite a lot so they must be doing something right you know Did you ever wanted to burn down an entire forest with a bunch of animals in it? Uh, well, you can do that in Terranil and it's very ethical. This is a reverse city builder where you transform a barren wasteland into a thriving ecosystem filled with different plants and animals. It's very calming and soothing. You just sit back in your chair, let the stress flow out of your body and slowly but surely transform a dead piece of land into a flourishing one. No big Mistakes, no big boss to fight, no massive plot twist, just chill, relax and kill a bunch of sea turtles for the fun of it. What more do you want? So uh, this is the only title on this list that I didn't finish, uh, not because I didn't want to, but because it kept making my PC crash every 30 minutes randomly. I don't know why, and I really didn't have the time to find out. I had a lot of games to play, you know? That aside, Alan Wake 2 is a survival horror game with a big emphasis on its narrative, which is two stories kinda woven together. You have Alan's story, which takes place in this twisty and confusing dimension filled with ghostly figures that try to kill you and then you do a musical performance because why not and saga anderson's story which is very detective based uh, both sides are really interesting and a lot of fun and i would probably put it higher on this list if i was able to play it more but yeah, i kind of don't want to brick my pc if you get what i mean bomb rush cyberfunk is a free roam scaling game about a guy that gets his head chopped off then you go on a cool adventure to find it back by doing a bunch of death defying tricks. It's also made by Dutch people, so it gets bonus points for me. Should be obvious, but this is a spiritual successor to Jet Set Radio. You just skate and tag while building up combos and running away from the popo. The only big criticism I have towards it is the price tag, because $40 reduce is a lot for an indie title, but hey, uh, you know, the NPCs do say funny things when you bump into them, so I can look past it. Funny smoking crab. Like, like, do I need to say more? Sludge Life 2 is a very simple walk around to see a bunch of goofy garbage kind of game. There isn't a huge narrative or anything. You just see funny stuff while collecting some random stuff. Tagging graffiti, collecting mixtapes, eating banana slugs. You get high a couple of times from eating blue mushrooms. It's extremely simple, short, and very chill. But that's what I liked about Sludge Life 1. So I'm happy they kept that magic for the sequel. You also have Big Mutt Sessions, which which is a free standalone demo version of Sludge Life 2 that you can fully complete in about 15 minutes or so. And here you can give uh, a Siggy to a cat, so uh, yeah, um, it's a masterpiece. 
Bleak Sword DX is a hack and slash arena fighter where you get dropped into a stage with a bunch of monsters and you simply have to defeat all of them while maintaining your stamina and using your abilities to its fullest. If I recall correctly, the original Bleak Sword was a iPhone game and they enhanced that version for consoles and PC by including a bunch of new content, graphical enhancements and quality of life improvements, which is really neat to see. And let me tell you man, this title doesn't mess around. It's really easy to learn, but damn tough to master. And I really like when titles take this approach to game design. If you're looking for something harsh, yet simple and rewarding, go check out the Bleak Sword DX, because it's another title that kind of flew under the radar this year. Did... hang on. Did you just shift reality? The dialogue in this game sucks. A teleporter! It's equivalent to the funny for spoken girl going, did I, I just do that? that? She says that three did times by the way, I don't think did I ever I mentioned that. that. Besides the dumb yapping though, Viewfinder is a very neat puzzle game that manages to really twist your mind in creative ways with very simple camera slash perspective trickery and it uses this to make some fun mind bending puzzles that require you to think a bit outside of the box. My favorite parts are when you get a photo, drawing or painting with a different art style and then you can just walk into the picture and be able to interact with some things here and there. My personal favorites of these is this pixel art game screenshot with a waterfall which has a uh, very swag and cool secret hidden behind it. Very, very cool. My Friendly Neighborhood is classic Resident Evil survival horror but with puppets that hug you instead of zombies that bite you every 5 seconds. It stands very well on its own feet though, even though it takes a lot of mechanics from the original Resident Evil, like limited saves, segmented areas and having to get rid of enemies even after defeating them in combat. Also Arlo from the YouTube channel Arlo voices the main antagonist for some reason, which is pretty funny I guess. It's a very competent and fun take on the genre and as a bonus it's also one of the only mascot horror games that doesn't take the we kidnapped a bunch of children root of storytelling which is really goddamn refreshing i'm looking at you three why are you all the same Slayer's X Terminal Aftermath Vengeance of the Slayer, yeah, yeah, that's the actual name of the game, is really, really cool because the creator of it responds to a bunch of Steam reviews by making your mom jokes. I'm not joking about that, by the way. This is real and I, I think it's pretty funny. This is an immensely charming boomer shooter about an edgy guy that found his lost game that he made in the late 90s and then decided to finally finish it. He also keeps saying, The S Blade has a hack blood charge. The S Blade has a hack blood charge. The S Blade has a hack blood you blow up a bunch of goofy enemies with stupid wacky weapons, explore fun interactive environments, you see your girlfriend transform into a werewolf and then you have to kill her which is pretty sad. It's bursting with personality and charm, especially the cutscenes which are made crappy on purpose. It's so stupid and I love it for that. You also shoot funny poop monsters so you know it gets my stamp of approval. If you know me, then you also know that I absolutely love the first two Banjo-Kazooie games, but for some reason, Xbox doesn't want to make a new one. They'd rather make a crappy vampire looter shooter instead. Thankfully though, Corn Kid 64 manages to somewhat fill that Banjo-Kazooie sized hole in my heart by just being a goofy and charming title that perfectly captures the magic that made a early 3D collectathon platformer fun. It's just a funny little game where you play it is a funny little guy, challenging platforming, goofy dialogue, charming visuals and animations. Corn Kid 64 has it all. You get about 10 hours of gameplay for just 7 big ones, which uh, in Fortnite terms has less than half a Bender Futurama skin. Crazy, I know, right? Hi-Fi Rush is a hack and slash rhythm game where you play as a guy with an iPod Nano in his chest that gives him musical superpowers. Then he goes on a quest to take down Amazon by fighting a bunch of robots while staying the entire time on beat. It's a stupid dumb game where you get slapped like a little B word. 
and I think it's pretty funny. My favorite aspect of it though is that everything is in the rhythm, literally everything. The hut moves to the music, the combat is in rhythm, the environment, your walk cycle, and even when you're in a cutscene, everything is still played on the beat, and I think it's awesome. The entire thing is just something you vibe to while going through it. It's a very artsy, funny, and addictive game that they are only charging 30 bucks for. Can we please normalize pricing triple slash double A games under 60 bucks? Alan Wake 2 and Ass Creed Mirage did this too this year, and I think it's such a based move when we're living in an age where they want to charge 70 bucks for a lot of these titles. But yeah, um, Hi-Fi Rush is uh, very, very good. Please go check it out. Alright, so uh, I know that I got sponsored by this game before, but I am 100% genuine when I say this. RoboQuest is awesome. This is a fast-paced, first-person, looter-shooter, action roguelike, that's a mouthful, about shooting a bunch of goofy robots with a dozen or so weapons that all have their own quirky gimmicks. And then you also have different characters and gadgets, character upgrades, weapon affixes, items, crystals, workshop upgrades. There are so many things you can play with and upgrade to the point that I'm not even reading more than half of it most of the time. RoboQuest is a jam, man. It's something I I just keep jumping back into again and again and it's without a shadow of a doubt in my top five favorite roguelike slash roguelites of all time it's addictingly fun In Cocoon, you play as a little moth guy that jumps into orbs that have entire worlds within them. And you can carry those orbs and bring them into other orbs, which as you may guess, makes for some really mesmerizing and cool puzzles. It also does all of this while using a joystick and one button, nothing more. It's a really clever and charming adventure, not much more to say here, but it's one of those games where once you finish it, you go, damn. Okay, that was awesome. I'm gonna be real with you for a bit, alright? Uh, throughout this year, I've been extremely jaded towards Tears of the Kingdom. I started to see the game in this negative light. I played for a few hours when it came out, and I remember having a lot of fun, but uh, after that, life got in the way. I got super busy with work and IRL stuff, and I just didn't bother touching it anymore. I even started to tell myself that the game wasn't that good. Well, uh, I am here to say that uh, past me was a stupid, dumb moron, because in Tears of the kingdom you can make a little go-kart and ride around like an idiot you just look at me this is awesome the biggest accomplishment of tears of the kingdom is that there is such a big sense of adventure and experimentation here even more compared to breath of the wild there is so much to explore so many secrets to discover and items to find it is so incredibly overwhelming there is always something to go for something to find something to play with the amount of times i've gotten distracted from what i was planning on originally doing is in the triple digits this was also my most anticipated game of the year, so uh, imagine my shock when five other games managed to top it. Um, yeah, uh, 2023 has been insane. Rain World Downpour is a DLC for Rain World that introduces a handful of new characters, all with their own unique abilities, new enemies, zones, entire campaigns, game modes, and a lot more. It literally quadruples the amount of content compared to the base game, which is insane. Now, Rain World itself is an evil, brutal game that likes to bully you continuously, and Downpour um, is even worse. Uh, trust me, alright? At first, you will hate everything about it, but it's a game that will most definitely grow on you over time and I think it's truly something special and uh, yes uh, that's my quote that they used in the accolades trailer thank you video cult I think you guys are pretty cool <laughs> You know the sorting mechanic from the original Resident Evil 4? Well, uh, that's basically dredge, but instead of ammo and weapons, it's funny fish. You catch a bunch of them, sell them for the balloon so you can upgrade your boat and equipment so you can catch even more fish. It also has a very dark and spooky undertone, which is fun to explore. But my personal favorite part is the messed up, goofy ass fish you can catch. They had to draw like almost a hundred of these messed up creatures, and it's always neat to see what you're gonna get. What the f- <laughs> What is this? 
it. This fish has a little squid thing living in it. They got the one referencing the alien franchise. Black hole fish, three headed fish, fish with octopus tentacle tongue, decaying fish, big bulbous eye shark, fish from England, stupid ass vortex fish, red king inspired fish, a fish that's collapsing on itself, astral projection fish, little lizard fish, or whatever the hell this is. They even got a hollow knight inspired one. Like, come on, that's awesome. I am very simple minded. When I see a Mario platformer, the only thing that I will say is hell yeah. Super Mario Bros. Wonder was such an amazing surprise for 2023. We didn't even know about its existence until we were halfway through the year. Then it comes out, I arrive at the second level and it goes... How can you not love this? It's filled to the absolute brim with creativity while also never dwelling on any of it. Each level jumps from idea to idea to idea to idea. You raise a wiggler, turn into a piece of cake, walk on walls, you turn into a goomba and a funny spiky ball. Every single level, every single one of them is an absolute joy to zoom through. It's a Mario at its absolute peak. I've played this remake for over 80 hours in the span of 10 days, so uh, I feel like I'm pretty qualified to say that uh, this game is pretty good. Resident Evil 4 Remake is just a non-stop action thrill ride from start to end of wacky hijinks, with the star of the show being the gunplay and combat, which is so crisp, so satisfying to toy with. When you land a headshot and you see their head just pop off, just... Mm. Ooh, it, it feels so crazy. good. And then a few months later, Capcom went, oh yeah, here's an extra little bonus story for just 10 big boys. This game is awesome, okay? Please don't sleep on it. Yeah, it's Pizza Tower, the doy. I've already said this like six times. Here's the thing, all right. The types of games I usually appreciate the most are the ones that bring up some sort of emotion within me. Maybe overcoming a brutal challenge or solving a cryptic mystery all on my own to find an entire secret world to explore. For Pizza Tower, it went like this. Uh, I finished the game on stream and I went, all right, that was fun. Then I P-ranked the first stage and something just snapped within me. And after that, I instantly knew that Pizza Tower would be my favorite game of the year. This was in January, by the way, meaning it had a lot of competition to overcome. Pizza Tower is a masterpiece. Don't let all the internet schmuck pull it down for you, all right? It's a challenging, funny, and charming as hell 2D platform that gives you such a rush while playing it. Perfecting the movement is crazy satisfying. The bosses are goofy fun. The ending is hilarious. The music slaps so incredibly hard. And and honestly, I feel honored to give it the annual crappy poo poo stinky dinky award of 2023. You might have lost best indie debuts to Cocoon, but at least you got this piece of junk. Yay! And uh, yeah, uh, th that's my list. If you're wondering where all of these games are, well, uh, I either didn't have the time to play slash finish them, or they are a PS5 exclusive. And I sold my PS5 because it has no games. Sorry, not sorry. Thanks for watching, everyone. Subscribe. Bye bye. <laughs>